Hello and welcome to Swift Goose. Today we're going to look at dictionaries in Swift, specifically declaration and creation, adding and updating items, working with account and capacity, removing items, and then finally we'll walk through an in-depth example. Dictionaries are unordered collections of key value pairs, and keys must be unique, but you can have different keys pointing to the same values. And finally, keys must be hashable. Your basic types, like string, integer, and boolean in Swift, are all hashable by default, so if you're just working with a dictionary of these, you don't have to worry about that. But if you're working with a struct or class as your key, you'll have to ensure that they conform to the hashable protocol. Let's start by declaring a snack dictionary, which will hold a string integer key value pair. Var snack, set it of type. To declare our dictionary, we will put our key type first, followed by a colon and then our value type. Now, if we want to create an empty dictionary, we can call snack equals braces and then just put a colon. Now this will initialize an empty string integer dictionary for us. Right away, we can see it's empty by accessing the dictionary's count property, snack.count, and we'll put this in a print statement, zero. To start adding snacks to our dictionary, we would call snack, put Doritos, and then set our quantity equal to one. Now if we print out our dictionary, print snack, we'll see we have one item in there, Doritos, quantity one. Another way to add a new key value pair to our dictionary would be to use the update value method. If the key value pair does not exist, it will create it. Otherwise, you'll be able to update the value for the key that does exist. Let's make a new snack using update value, set it to three, and this will be Skittles. Now let's print out our snack again. Now we have three Skittles and one Doritos. In this case, since the Skittles key did not exist in the dictionary, it went ahead and created a new key value pair of Skittles three in our snack dictionary. Now let's update our Doritos value to be 500. Doritos. As we saw above, we can use the count property to obtain how many items are in our dictionary, or we can check the is empty property of our dictionary to see if our dictionary is empty. Generally speaking, you should use the is empty property if you're trying to determine if it's empty rather than checking to see if count equals zero. So let's print out our snack.count. We have two items in there. Now let's print out our snack.isEmpty false, of course. And now let's print out our capacity. So you'll notice there's two items in our dictionary, but our capacity is three. So what's going on here? Well, to answer this, let's go back and look at the capacity of our initial snack when we created it as empty. And on the way, let's clean up some of our print statements so that it's not so messy. Now above, let's print out our snack.capacity. When we press play, there's no capacity since we set it to be empty and there's nothing in it. Now let's copy these print statements and put them below where we added our first item. Run the code and one. Now let's put the same print statements below our Skittles edition and see what happens. We have three and two. Since here our capacity was one and our count was also one, our capacity was met. But on line 15, when we add a new item to our dictionary, now our count is above our capacity. So Swift needs to reallocate a new block of contiguous memory to hold our dictionary. And while it's reallocating to a new block of memory, it adds a new capacity for us in case more key value pairs are being added to the dictionary. So if we add another snack to our dictionary, we would expect our count and capacity to both be three. So let's do that now. Snack of nerds rope equals five and let's print out our snack and we'll print out our count and capacity again now you see we have three items our capacity is three and our count is three now that our capacity and count match let's see what happens when we add another new snack to our dictionary snack of iced honey bun equals three Again, let's print out our whole dictionary, the capacity, and the count. 
So now you see we have four items, our capacity is now six, and the count is four. So when Swift is reallocating memory for our dictionary that is growing in size, it's going to double the capacity value of the previous capacity in order to make room for any new key value pairs that might be added. If you know in advance how many key value pairs your dictionary is going to hold, it can be useful to call the reserve capacity method to reserve that capacity ahead of time. Reserving capacity of your dictionary ahead of time will help improve performance of your dictionary. So let's create another new dictionary var veggie this will be of type string int tomato one now let's print out our capacity and count veggie veggie we have one for both and now let's reserve some additional capacity so that we can add a couple different vegetables later on veggie dot reserve capacity and let's add enough space for 31 vegetables. And now let's print out our vegetable capacity and count. We requested 31 additional spaces, but we got 48. Our capacity property seems to be ascending in multiples of two, starting from three. So let's reserve a capacity of 50 and see what happens. We get 96, which is double of 48. So although we specified 50 extra capacity, it's given us 96 just in case we need to add more. This block of 96 spaces in memory is contiguous so that operations will be faster with this dictionary. Now let's look at removing items from our snack dictionary. You can remove one item at a time by calling snack.remove and we have four key. Removes the given key in its associated value and notice also that it returns an optional integer. So in this case, it's returning the value of that key if there is one. So let's try to remove our Doritos from our dictionary. And we get optional 500. So what's happening is we are removing the Doritos key and it's returning the value that was associated with that key, which is 500. But again, it's an optional because this key might not have existed. So if you're going to work with it, you'll have to nil coalesce or use binding or force unwrapping. Let's print out our snack to make sure that it's actually gone. And we don't have Doritos anymore. And finally, let's remove all of our items from our dictionary. Snack.remove. And there's two different options. There's remove all, which will delete our capacity as well. Or we can keep our capacity by setting a Boolean flag to be true. In this case, let's just remove all of our items print snack and we're left with an empty dictionary as we said earlier it's important to know that the keys must be unique inside of a dictionary but you can have multiple keys pointing to the same value so let's look at a quick example of this in our snack dictionary snack of Doritos will equal one and if we try to set a new key value pair of Doritos you'll see what happens. Print out our snack again. So since the key Doritos already existed, we can't make a new key called Doritos. So instead it updates the value of Doritos to five. But we can add another snack, nerds rope, and set that value to five. So in this case, our keys do not match, but the values do match. And again, let's print out our snack. And we have five nerds rope and five Doritos. Now let's look at an in-depth example of using a dictionary to hold a Magic the Gathering card collection. And actually first, let's comment out all of our previous code to make it a little bit more clear what we're doing. Let's use a struct to model out an individual Magic card that might be in the collection. Struct Magic Card and we'll make this of type custom string convertible so that way we can print out a description of the magic card later on. Let's declare a description so that this message will go away for us. A magic card has a rarity being common, uncommon, or rare. So this would be a good opportunity to use an enum. Enum rarity, and we'll set this of type string and raw representable. So that way we can print out our cases without having to set a raw value for them. 
we have a common, uncommon, and rare. Each of our cards in our collection also has a condition, so it could be heavily played, it could be lightly played, good, very good, or near mint. Enum condition. Again, we'll use raw representable so that we can print out our cases. Case heavily played, lightly played, good, very good, and near mint. And now we'll set some variables. We have a card name, type string. We have a rarity of the card, and that's gonna be of type rarity. And we have a condition. Now we'll set this to variable because the condition can change over time. And now let's create an initializer. Name string, rarity, type rarity. Condition will be of type condition. And we'll set our name and our rarity and our condition in our description here. In our case, we're going to use an individual magic card as the key for our collection because we want to search our magic card collection for an individual card with a rarity type. And the value will just be the count of that card. So var mtg collection. And this will be of type magic card, int, and we'll initialize it to be empty first. Now right away we get this error saying that our magic card doesn't conform to hashable. If you remember, before we said that our keys for our dictionaries have to be hashable. So let's go back up here and make sure that our magic card conforms to hashable. And the error message is gone. So let's add our first card to our collection. MDG collection, and we'll put a magic card, and we have our initializer, mind over matter. It's a rare, and the condition near mint equals one. And let's add a couple more. Black Lotus and near mint, and we'll put that we have 10 of them. And then let's add a common card, mountain. And the rarity will be heavily played since we've used this mountain several times. Now let's say we went to the card store yesterday and bought two more mind over matters. One of them was near mint and the other one was pretty heavily played. And we will put this one as heavily played. And then let's use the update value to update our value to two since we bought another near mint. Update value, set the value to two, and the key, we actually have to plug in the specific magic card that we're looking for. In this case, since we bought a near mint, we'll paste this card here. Now let's print out our whole collection and see what we have. Since our magic card has a description for it, when we print out the actual key, the key is now showing up as this new description value. So this is the key for this card, and the value is two. We can print out all of our magic card collection keys using mtg collection.keys, and the same is true for our values. Press play. And you see we have mind over matter rare near mint and all of our other keys, as well as our individual values. Now let's make two methods that help us find cards in our collection. The first method will give us a count of a specific card name and condition that might be in our collection. Funk get number of card. We'll put in our collection here that we'll pass in. Magic card int. And then the name of the card that we're looking for. So we'll give an argument label here called name. This will be of type string. Rarity is of type magic card dot rarity. And our condition as well of the card. Condition. Let's type magic card dot condition. And this whole thing should return an optional integer because we expect to get a card back or a count of the card rather, but we don't know if we're going to get anything back. And to help us read this a little bit better, let's put some new line statements. 
And now we just have to check our collection for the card that we're looking for, and then return the number of cards that we have. Return collection magic card, and we're looking for our name, and our rarity, and our condition. Let's put this to use and call get number of card. And the collection we're looking for is our magic collection. We're going to look for Black Lotus, rare, and the condition. Let's look for near mint. And press play. And you see that we found 10. Well, let's check our collection and see if we have any heavily played ones. No, we don't have any. And finally, let's create a method that helps us search our collection by name for a specific card and then return that card. And this method will loop through all the cards in our collection to see if it can find any card that matches that name. Actually, let's get rid of our print statements here. Funk search collection by name. And we'll put in a collection here. Again, we'll copy this. And we're going to look for a card called name string. And we want to return an actual magic card here. So let's put magic card. And we'll put a question mark again, because if it finds nothing, we want to return nil. And let's put our open braces. And again, we can put our parameters on separate lines just to help readability. Let's loop through the cards in our collection and check for any matches. For card in collection, if card, now we want to grab the key here, dot key, dot name. So if our card's key, which is the card itself, and name equals name, then we will return our card. You see that our key is an individual magic card, so that's why we want to return our key itself. So let's put key, and then we would need to return nil in case nothing was found. Our function will loop through our card collection, looking at each individual card, and if it finds the card key by name, it will return the first match that it finds. So let's print out search collection by name, and we're gonna look through our magic card collection, and we're gonna look for a card called mountain. Press play. And you see that we did find a mountain. It's common and it's heavily played. And again, remember that it's optional because the dictionary could return nothing. So if we wanna actually use this magic card, we're gonna to have to unwrap it. That's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, and remember to hit the dinner bell.